Farmers who invest in their stud bulls and cows will know and appreciate the value of good healthy animals. The same applies to ACDs, who are multitaskers on the farm and we anticipate will save farmers huge amounts of money in work. Australian studies indicated this was as much as 40,000 Oz dollars for the lifetime of a dog in savings. Um, and on top of it, they save you, they, they give you safety on your farm because they manage dangerous animals on your behalf. In addition, they make wonderful companions, outstanding bodyguards, all for two meals a day and the agreement that you will respect their needs, which their priorities, which are you, you and you. My journey with cattle dogs started in 1998 when Noel and I met our first cattle dog, Josh, owned and loved by Diana Greathead, a farmer in Colesburg. Two years later, we got our first cattle dog, Charlie, and after that, we got our second cattle dog, Amber, which is when I was made to promise that I would breed at least one litter with her. And so as time went by, this litter became the proverbial baptism of fire for me. I'm, at the time when I was ready to breed with Amber, I made inquiries and was told that I needed to do the SAVA, which is the South African Veterinary Association eye exam, and I needed to have her hip graded. Nobody mentioned Bayer testing to me or progressive retinal atrophy, which was already a, a disease that was on high alert in the rest of the world, but for some reason in South Africa, we hadn't picked up on it. So when the litter was born and I realized that I had two deaf puppies, I started making inquiries. There was very little information. I had been told to look out for a deaf puppy, but nobody had said that the incidence was high. In fact, I was led to believe it was only 3% within our breed, when in actual fact, cattle dogs have a very high incidence of breed, second only to Dalmatians. A PRA, I'm just going to refer to it as PRA, which causes blindness in dogs. In our breed, they can start going blind as early as two years, and depending on the process, will be completely blind within a couple of years. I found a supplement that worked extremely well, and that I believe definitely meant that my dogs had sight after the deterioration of their retinas started for about six years before it started escalating beyond anything that we could control. Uh, Optogen found it had, had already identified a gene for this disease in 1998. So in 2008, when I discovered that my puppies had it, um, there was no excuse for South Africans not to have known about it and not to have been testing for it. Today, every ethical breeder has three things that in common, and it's an obsession about health testing, breeding away from dogs that display serious temperament issues and finding good homes for our puppies is what we really are terribly important to all of us. The big question about this is why, what, what is the reason that we're so obsessed with it? And it's really because our dogs can't do what they were bred to do if they're deaf, blind or crippled. When we look at pictures of our dogs, we see dogs that can jump, can run flat out, are strong and muscular, have incredible physical abilities, um, way beyond their size and weight. And it is in order to keep our dogs doing these things that we, we work to keep them and breed them in a healthy way, besides the quality of their life, which must also be important. So if your dog is, has hip dysplasia, for example, I have a dog, Tandy, who when he was born as a young puppy, he was very healthy. And at 10 weeks of old, he and Bella sitting on my left both became critically ill and were treated for a week in intensive care. And one of the things that, is, is, that can cause hip dysplasia, besides the hereditary aspects of it, is medication. And I had to make a choice. Did I want to save these puppies' lives and risk hip dysplasia because one of the medications had a reputation for causing it, or would I risk their death? And obviously, I chose that we would save them. And later, when Tandy was 18 months old, we took him for hip grading, and he graded with what we call D1, D2 hips. Um, I immediately made a decision that as gorgeous as he was, we would never breed with him because this is the quickest way to increase the incidence in our breed. Tandy to this day won't, won't, will always choose to avoid jumping. His games are all about chasing a frisbee, picking it up off the grass, not jumping for it. Uh, if he's up on a high wall, he will never jump off it. He will go to the steps to walk down them while all the others jump and beat him. When he walks next to me, uh, he gets terribly excited, but he also never jumps on me. 
So you can see that the dog clearly has hip dysplasia, he's feeling the effects of it. He would be absolutely useless at working under these circumstances. That's a very good reason to do it. The other things that we love to do with our dogs are sports. Many people do agility. We need good healthy limbs for that. Many people take their dogs cycling. Our dogs are what are known as Velcro dogs. They're great at protecting. They couldn't protect you if they were, had, were physically unable to do it. And so this is why we work really hard at keeping them not just as good healthy working dogs, but as good healthy all-rounders that they are. The reputation of the dogs in their um, reputation is a cattle dog. Many people suspect that cattle dogs or believe that cattle dogs really just love working. What they really just love is their owners. Everything that they do is for their owners. They have great instincts that they can use to their owners' advantage. They will protect you with their lives. They have a mean punch. I have a friend who does man work with her Malinois and they have found that cattle dogs can knock a man down as quickly as a Malinois can. So they, they, they are wonderful dogs. We also believe, uh, and we'll discuss it in the future on this program, that they have a role to play with managing stock theft. And so we will come to the tests, the actual tests and how we do them. And there are two tests that cannot be done with DNA. So it's the hip dysplasia and the Bayer test. Hip dysplasia, the dogs are sedated uh, because they have to be held in very strenuous positions to see the angles of the hip joints and that they're all fitting snugly and tightly. Um, and with the Bayer test, we do it when they're tiny puppies. They may not be less than seven weeks old. I always wait until close to eight weeks and I never take them in the eighth week because that's a big fear phase in their developmental stages and we don't want them to be afraid of the vets forever because they had this bad experience. So we take them there, the puppies are sedated and the Bayer machine has probes in the form of needles that are pushed under the puppy's skin. This could be quite daunting for the puppies which is why we sedate them. And then the machine produces sounds which the probes pick up if the puppy can hear and so it's recorded as hearing or not. It's a very good process, it works well, and it gives us the opportunity to know the status of our dogs when we're homing them, number one. If I'm homing a deaf puppy or a unilateral, which is a dog who can hear in one ear, I need to be able to tell the owners. And in fact, the owners need to choose that they would be willing to have those dogs. I'll talk about that in a moment. I just also want to tell you that is how we can eliminate deaf dogs from our breeding gene pool. So scientists ask us not to eliminate our affected dogs, but with deafness we do, um, because it increases exponentially the percentage of deafness in the breed. The genetic testing that we can do, this is our best weapon in our war against hereditary diseases, is genetic testing. So it's scientists who have done research, they've pinpointed what they call alleles, which is a gene that causes these problems. And so we have DNA testing for progressive retinal atrophy. It works really well. And um, what we do with these dogs is once we, once we know their status, we have a pattern A, which is clear, a pattern B, which is a carrier, and a pattern C, which is affected. And the scientists have said, don't take them out because it will exacerbate other genes and other diseases within our gene pool. This is all to do with breeding coefficients, etc. I'm sure most of the farmers listening will know what we're talking about. So when it comes to the results of PRA and any of the hereditary diseases, what we aim to do is breed dogs that will not be affected. So if you have parents that are both clear for a disease, all the puppies will automatically be clear. And this is recorded on their pedigree certificates is clear by parentage and you can breed those puppies without retesting them. If you get a carrier or affected, we're inclined to put carriers and affected dogs always to pattern A if we can. If you breed carrier to affected, you can still get affected dogs. If you breed um, two carriers to each other, 25% of those puppies could be affected. So we don't want to breed dogs that are born to be blind. So we aim to always put carriers and affected to pattern A, which is the clear. And then from those matings, we again will have to test the puppies so that we know their status. And if we choose, if we're lucky, we can choose only clear dogs to continue our breeding. Or if not, we will then again manage the diseases going forward, always checking that we are breeding puppies that won't be affected by diseases and checking that that continues going forward. 
it's not difficult, but it's costly. And the question always arises from the cost of these tests. Do we have to test if the disease's incidences aren't very high? And I thought about this a long time because it is expensive. And in South Africa, we, for some reason, lag way behind the rest of the world. We don't, very few breeders break even on their litters because of these costs. So what do I think about it? I thought about it long and hard. And then suddenly that little thing that I learned when I was in grade school called the stitch in time saves nine popped into my mind. And I really feel that ethical breeders would take that to heart. Going, going back, to that very first litter that I did, which is the litter that left me determined that all breeders should be, should know what they're doing, should be able to produce good healthy dogs and none of us should be ignorant of what is at stake when we do this, when we breed. So most, but most breeders today will place their puppies in screened homes with binding purchase agreements. This protects both the buyer and the breeder. Uh, we will generally give our puppies a medical test at the vet that it will confirm that they are in good health before we leave them. And um, this is basically what we try to encourage for all our breeders in Cattle Dog Connection, which is a new club that has started and is still very much in the starting process. We still have to have inaugural meetings, decide how we're going to run the club. This has to be a decision for a team and not for one person to make. And certainly we would have hold our breeders in Cattle Dog Connection to very high standards and we would have owners who would be watching us and sharing with us our sorrows and our joys.